I'm going to be talking about my experience with racism in the swing community. I know this is a very, uh, very touchy subject for a lot of people, and this is my very first time I'm openly expressing my experiences in this format. The point of this video is not to make people upset or garner pity. I just want to be that voice that continues to challenge people not to think on autopilot, especially when it comes to people issues that continue to impact swing dancing. I'm ultimately going to talk about this because I want to see swing dancing preserved and innovated with care. So. I'm going to cover just a little bit of my own personal experience along with some actual accounts in jazz history. So it might get a little long, but stick with me. Now, as you listen, please keep your feelings grounded by always imagining yourself being put in the other person's situation. I like to call this keeping a mindset of intellectual honesty and moral consistency. Now, I will say up front that I'm not too quick to use the word racism the way everybody likes to throw that word around today. Many of the things that I've experienced had to do more with people prejudging me based on things other than my character. And even though we've all had that happen, a lot of people like using the word as a weapon to get people to do whatever they want them to do. And I normally don't like to use it because of this type of dishonesty, but I will use the word racism in this video to highlight my points and to challenge you to be more intellectually honest. Let me just first say that I have never experienced racism in the swing dance community like the claims of many other people who have experienced racism in the swing dance community. No one has ever rejected dancing with me because of my skin color or called me the N word. I've you know, had someone make fun of my hair, but who hasn't had that happen before? However, I have experienced being prejudged by people who expected me to behave a certain way all because of my complexion. And when I didn't meet those expectations, their attitude changed and their true character was exposed. And this happened from people with all kinds of various complexions. You see how I said that? I don't even like to use the words white or black people because we really don't mean just their skin color. In a way, the culture today that we live in uses those terms, white people and black people, in such a subtle way to imply that color equates with behavior. And that really isn't right. In my case, a lot of this type of prejudgment happen mostly from people who project to be so open-minded. Most people today wouldn't even deem my unique experiences with racism in the swing community as racism, according to how the people use the word today. Now, my first encounter happened after winning my second competition. Years ago, I was one of the only Americans with brown skin who could swing dance at a level of just a little bit above mediocrity. And I ended up working with a world-class instructor and won first place at an international competition. I then started getting a whole bunch of attention and people that I didn't even know started to contact me from other countries to invite me to come over to their country to teach. I initially thought like, wait a minute, I just, I won a competition. It was choreography and I'm, still learning how to do this dance. But for whatever reason, me being a novice teacher and an okay social dancer didn't matter. Even though I won that competition based on a lot of hard work, I still didn't feel okay being hired as an international instructor. But I understand why people from other countries wanted to hire me and it's because of what I like to call the Chuck Norris principle. Now you gotta follow me. You see when a group of people are wanting to learn uh, Chinese Kung Fu and they're learning from Chuck Norris, in their minds, it's kind of an inauthentic experience because though Chuck Norris ha may have the skills, he's not Chinese. And if people suddenly see a person who looks like Bruce Lee, they wanna automatically start taking classes from that guy. I get it. Some of that thinking process may be rooted in real racism, but I doubt it. Most of the time, it's just a value projection based on someone's ethnic look. That's why I got hired at first. Most won't even call that racism, nor will they have the guts to call it privilege. And yes, for those of you who are hyper-political, we all receive 
privileges based on things others may not have the benefits of having. Some people are tall, some people are short, both have advantages and disadvantages. Many other people were well qualified to be hired, but unfortunately, they did not have the skin color that matched the people who created the dance. And even though they could dance better than me, they weren't shown as much favoritism. It's as simple as that. And if I'm intellectually honest and morally consistent, I received what I like to call brown privilege. Now, at the time, I was four years into marriage and I, you know, we just had our first kid and I wanted to be really respected for my swing dance contribution, even though I didn't have that much time to invest in my skills. So in a way, this brown privilege was a great motivator for me to continue developing and not just become that token black dancer gimmick, whatever that means. As my teaching pedagogy and dance skills improved, more internationals started seeing me, and as a result, they started respecting me as someone who deserved attention based upon my actual skills. But here's the ironic thing. During this entire time of me teaching and traveling internationally with some of the best dancers in the world, I was never invited to any of the major events in my own country, which is really weird when you think about it. Let me give you just a quick example to help you think consistently. And this is for you American dancers. Think about this. What if former President Donald Trump owned all of the swing dance events in America, knowing the art was created by black Americans and never invited the only pro black American to any of his events? Just let that sink in. People would be screaming racism from the rooftops and we all know it. Not one major American event known internationally invited me to teach. Didn't matter if it was California, DC, Houston, New York, didn't matter. They didn't invite me to judge, they didn't invite me to teach or even speak on the black experience in America, nothing. According to this modern definition of so-called racism, what other reason could there be to not invite an internationally known Lindy Hopper who is black. Now, I'm not so quick to just say that it was because of my color. I think it was for reasons that line up more with my second experience of racism. And this is the one that was more alarming for me. I like to call my first example of racism favoritism and not racism because it happened in a positive light. But I could argue, even though it was positive, the initial reason to hire me was based more on color. So eventually after uh, traveling uh, many years teaching internationally, I was invited to one major American event. And at the time, the event had a bunch of bad publicity because of a lot of alarming, just bad criminal activity taking place. They, of course, were trying to clean up the event's image and made major changes the year they invited me. That year, they hired uh, an entire female band and a bunch of black teachers. Nothing wrong with doing either of those things. But I honestly don't believe the changes they made were put in place to really deal with the root of the problems they were having. As sad as it sounds, I honestly feel they made the changes to, <laughs> to make them look like, hey, we're not sexist and oh, we, we're not the racist white people. I've always liked to visit a community at least once. So I responded to the invitation and provided my credentials with a list of instructors who I taught with regularly. But what took me by surprise is that the event insisted I worked with none of the main professional partners listed on my contract. Instead, they wanted me to work with a partner who had very little experience, but who happened to have one thing in common with me, skin color. Initially, I thought, okay, this is kind of forward and odd that they would prioritize skin color over teaching and dancing ability, especially after all these years I've been teaching. So this is an international event bringing in just a lot of talent. And of course, people want to pay for the best talent. Now, of course, I gave them the benefit of the doubt, but what made the situation even more alarming was they were flying international instructors from everywhere, but they wanted me, out of all people, to carpool. I had to be as diplomatically firm as possible to get them to treat me the same way they treated my peers. Sounds crazy, but it happened. 
Now, of course, I didn't jump on the internet and start screaming racism and demanding that people hire me only because of my color. I tried to model myself after Duke Ellington's example on how he handled John Hammond. Now, many of you all do not know, but John Hammond was a very wealthy and influential promoter of jazz and was responsible for putting together so many jazz people on the map. Benny Goodman, Billie Holiday, Count Basie, Charlie Christian, uh, Lionel Hampton, Bob Dylan, Bruce Springsteen. There's just so many artists that he helped. There's a really good book called The Producer that covers his story in detail, which I will uh, put a link in the description. One of the things that John was passionate about was jazz music, but what he loved even more than jazz music was his political ideology. He was so obsessed that he used it to impose what he wanted onto jazz and it caused a lot of harm to the artists in the jazz community at the time. Yes, he's responsible for so many good things like integrating the first jazz band, connecting Billie Holiday with Teddy Wilson, um, connecting Lionel Hampton with Benny Goodman. But in most cases, all of those connections and all the things he did came with a catch. Everything had to be on his terms, which included his political ideology. If you were talented and championed what he believed, or even if you were just indifferent or just remained silent, he was all for you. If you didn't agree with him culturally appropriating jazz for his political platform, you were enemy number one. Now, whenever he encountered Duke Ellington, who wasn't interested in appropriating jazz as a political weapon to, for example, reform the civil rights movement in the South, John tried to sabotage his influence. Let me just read a little bit of this book, this excerpt here. So Hammond seems genuinely to have felt Ellington could have used his position as one of the most popular band leaders in America, black or white, to further the same civil rights causes that so consumed him. Now, Hammond also blasted Ellington because Duke had paid no attention to him. Ellington, already immensely popular and needing help from no one, paid no attention to Hammond's advice because he didn't want anyone to mess with his music. Isn't that interesting? So Ellington refused at first to publicly acknowledge the attack. He waited almost four years before he issued a response. And rather than defend himself, you know, he basically took Hammond to task for flagrantly violating conflict of interest standards. Here's what he said. To properly judge the modus operandi of Hammond, it is necessary to devote some thought to the man himself. He appears to be an ardent protagonist and champion of the lost cause. He apparently has consistently identified himself with the interest of the minorities, the Negro peoples, to a lesser degree, the Jew, and to the underdog in the form of the Communist Party. John has identified himself so strongly in certain directions that he no longer enjoys impartial status, which would entitle him to the role of critic. He has continued to publicize his opinions of musical units other than those to which he has been attached, freely condemning and condoning, ignoring the fact that he has forfeited the right to do so. Such tactics would not be tolerated from the businessman, and they are doubly unappreciated when employed by one whose name and position allow him to remain immune from counterattack. You see, think about this. John wanted to insert his political beliefs into jazz music and intimidate one of the greatest jazz influencers of all time, simply because Duke did not want to use his music for John's political causes. I have experienced this same type of conflict of interest in many ways throughout my influence in the swing dance community. I've continued to model my example off of Duke Ellington by just focusing on the art. But in the last 10 years, I have found it very difficult to just do that when a large portion of people currently influencing the swing dancing community are acting in ways 
that are more similar to John Hammond instead of functioning like Duke Ellington, who wanted to keep all of that stuff out of it. It doesn't matter how popular you are or how much money you have or how many years you've been associated with Lindy Hop or how many years you've been promoting it. You are either appropriating swing dancing as a platform to promote what you really care about, like John did, or you're not. I think all of us can learn a lesson from these two historical jazz figures. Many people will not deem what happened to Duke Ellington and myself as rooted in racism, even though John Hammond wrapped himself around wanting to help those minorities. But as soon as Duke Ellington said, I don't need your help, John's true colors came out and I've experienced the exact same thing. You know, when these big social political things were going on in the United States, you know, uh, police brutality and Black Lives Matter, LGBTQ, all this stuff was happening the last few years. I received literally like 250 friend requests on Facebook. And then once I said, hey, look guys, I'm not really interested in politics and stuff like that. I love swing dancing. I'm an expert at that. Guess what? They ignored me. Many of them defriended me. And I thought, are they in this because they love swing dancing? Or are they in this because they wanna use swing dancing for something else? So if you're gonna take one thing from this video today, just hear my heart. Let's at least consider the idea of people being individuals and not colors needing to fit the behavior we expect of them. Let's practice judging people based on what they do and not just for how we think they can benefit us. If we start there, I think there'll be a lot less racism claims being thrown around in the world. With that said, guys, thank you for listening. I'll see you soon.